Today's lesson is on sampling, frequency distribution, and graphs. So to start this unit on statistics, we need to go through a lot of definitions. So the first definition we're going to be talking about is um, the set containing all the people or objects whose properties are to be determined, described and analyzed by the data collector is called a population. A sample is a subset or subgroup of that population. So for example, the board members of a homeowners association want to survey the homeowners to get their opinions about new paint colors for common walls. The population is the set containing all of the homeowners in that association. Okay, But a sample would be any subset or subgroup of the homeowners in the neighborhood. So let's say there's like 250 homeowners and you can't go and ask every single one of the homeowners but you could uh, randomly pick maybe 25 and ask them and that 25 group would be the subset or a sample of the population. So that's the difference between a population and a sample. Now a random sample is a sample obtained in such a way that every element of the population has an equal chance of being selected for the sample. A representative sample is a sample that exhibits characteristics typical of those possessed by the target population. So consider our board members of the homeowners association who want to survey the homeowners to get their opinions about paint colors. And to obtain a random sample, the board can assign each house a number, say 1 through 250. So if there are 250 houses in the neighborhood, they would randomly choose 25 numbers, which are associated with the 250 houses, and then gather the opinions of just those um, of the properties. The sample is random because they randomly chose 25 numbers out of the 250 houses. The sample is representative of the population since they only surveyed homeowners within that neighborhood. Okay, So if we're trying to get opinions about new paint colors for common walls, but instead of surveying only people from their 250 houses, what if they just went to all of United States of America, surveyed some people in, in there and asked their opinion about the paint colors? Well, that wouldn't necessarily be representative of the association. So they only pull people from the 250 houses that they have in their population. For an example, a city government wants to conduct a survey among the city's homeless to discover their opinions about required residences in city shelters from midnight until 6 a.m. So what is the population of all of the people of this population would be the city's homeless individuals. So anyone that's homeless within their city limits would be part of that population. For part B, a city commissioner suggests obtaining a sample by surveying all of the homeless people at the city's largest shelter on a Sunday evening. Does this seem like a good idea? Explain your answer. Well, remember what we're trying to identify. Uh, the city government wants to get their opinions about a required residence in city shelters in the evening hours from midnight until 6 a.m. If you only survey people that are already at a shelter in the evening, what do you think their opinions might be? Is this a good random representative sample? Well, no, it's not. Okay, This is not representative because you're only surveying people who are already at the shelters and they might actually be a little bit more uh, likely to agree with having mandatory residence in city shelters. Okay, so let's write this only collects a sample from 
those who already chose to be at a shelter. So it excludes everyone that chooses not to go to a shelter at all. Additionally, these individuals are probably less likely to be against the mandatory residence in the evening hours. Because remember, they're already there. On a Sunday evening, they were already at the shelter. So the city commissioner's suggestion by obtaining a sample this way is probably not going to be a random representative sample of the city's homeless individuals. Next, we're going to talk about the frequency distribution. After we've collected data from a sample of the population, the next task is to represent the data in a condensed and manageable form so that the data can be more easily interpreted. For example, the temperature highs for this week are 68, 65, 68, 66, 65, 67, and 68. The list of data has seven data items of which some of the data items are identical. For example, uh, 65 occurs, let's see, twice. And 68 occurs three times. So a frequency distribution can be used to represent the data in two columns. The data values are listed in one column, uh, and the adjacent column is used for the frequency to indicate the number of times that each one occurred. So we said that 65 appears twice. We said 68, we already counted that up, that appears three times. And both 66 and 67 only occur once. If I add this up, I should get seven total values, one for every day of the week. So that's what a frequency distribution is going to look like. Another example, we can construct a frequency distribution for the data showing the final course grades for students in a pre-calc course, listed alphabetically by student name in a grade book. So they're not quite in order here of like highest to lowest, they're by someone's name in the grade book. These are fake grades, so don't assume that I'm pulling grades here, I'm not. So the five grades that are possible are A, B, C, D, and F. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through and tally to see how many we have for each, and then we're going to list the frequency in numerical form. So for the first one, I have an F, so I'm going to make a mark. I like also crossing it off so um, I don't forget one. Two C's, another B, a C, two A's, and I've done the first row. Now I have the second row, two C's, a D, another C, okay so this gives me three total A's, five total B's, five, six, seven, eight, nine C's, two D's and one F. So I often like to add these up. That's 8, 17, 18, 19, 20. So there's 20 grades here. So just make sure you can go back and count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Yep, there was 20 to begin with, so that's just a way so I didn't forget one. And so this right here is a frequency distribution. Now sometimes a frequency distribution can be cumbersome when there's many large uh, values or large range of values like the following data set. Look I have um, probably about 40 students here and their grades are ranging from like in the 40s all the way up to the 90s and there's just too many varied grade values for me to get. So in order to do this it may be more meaningful if we arrange the scores into groups or what we call classes based on something that interests us. This is called a grouped 
frequency distribution. Okay, so what would be helpful for this particular category? Well, uh, if we start at the bottom here, 90 to 99, that's uh, a good group because that gives you an A in the class, right? Whereas 80 to 89 gives you a B, 70 to 79 gives you a C, 60 to 69 gives you a D, and although anything lower than uh, 60 will give you an F, we have to keep our classes the same exact size. Notice that I didn't let um, one of the categories have more than one value. I didn't say 40 to 50, 50 to 59, because where would 50 go? So instead I went 40 to 49, then 50 to 59, so you never have uh, any overlapping values. So now I can go back and do my tallying. So 82, I'm going to make one tally mark in the group between 80 and 89. For 47, I'm going to make a tally mark for uh, between 40 and 49. For 75, I put a mark between 70 and 79. 64 goes in the 60s category. 57 goes in the 50s. We have another 80 category, a 63, and a 93. Now I'd like you guys to pause the video and so that you can try this on your own. Okay, so once you've got that done, notice we have a total of three tally marks between 40 and 49, six in the next class, six in the next class, 11, nine, and five. If we add this up, we do get 40 values, so that means I didn't miss any. So the lower class limit is the leftmost number in each class. So for example, the lower class limit for the first class we see here is 40. The upper class limit is the rightmost or largest number in each class. So the lower class limit for the first class would be 49. And the class width is the difference between any two consecutive lower class limits. So between the first and the second lower class limit, I can take 50 minus 40 and that gets us 10. So the class width for this particular group frequency is 10. And then you can take any other consecutive lower class limit and subtract them and you're still going to get the same class width. The same class width needs to be the same for the entire frequency distribution, otherwise it will be skewed a little bit.